Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our molecules in life. There were four types of organic molecules that we talked about in the last unit. We were going to go over them real quickly. They were the proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. Now the proteins were made of amino acids, and those are the ones that built us. So they're used for support, transport, and as enzymes, things of that nature. The carbohydrates were our sugars, and you can see the names here, monosaccharide, disaccharide, and polysaccharide. That tells us how many sugars are attached. And remember that the sugars were the main source of energy for life. We also have our lipids down here, and those are our fats and our oils. They were made up of glycerol and fatty acids, and this is how we stored energy. They were also important in certain cell parts, like the cell membrane. And then finally, we talked a little bit about nucleic acids, and those were made up of our nucleotides, and these are our DNA and RNA, and those are the ones that store this hereditary information. So remember these four, okay? We're going to talk about them and where they fit into our cell a little bit later on in this unit. Okay, so this picture here shows us a little bit of organization and how we can kind of put things together. We started off and we talked a little bit about atoms and we said that two or more atoms can come together and they can form a molecule. Now these molecules can come together to form a larger molecule which we called a macromolecule and we'll see in this unit how those macromolecules can form organelles which ultimately will form a cell. Now a bunch of cells working together forms a tissue and if we get a bunch of tissues working together, we get to an organ, and a bunch of organs working together gets to an organ system, and then ultimately that will take us to the organism itself. And this is kind of how we want to keep this organization together. So we start off small here with the atom, and we can get all the way up to the organism itself. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the discovery of the cell. Back in the 1500s, microscopes were invented, and the first microscopes were nothing more than a magnifying glass. It was just a lens that allowed people to make things look a little bigger. From there, they put a couple of these together, and we came up with a compound microscope. And in 1665, a scientist by the name of Robert Hooke looked at cork. And as he looked through his microscope, he noticed when he looked in there, and let me draw real quickly what it looked like, is he saw all of these little areas, these little boxes. And it reminded him of small little like cells in a jail or something like that. And so he coined this little thingy right here as being a cell, and that's the name that stuck. Okay? Now, a couple years later, Anton van Leeuwenhoek saw living cells. So what Robert Hooke really saw were the cell walls of a dead cell, and that's what cork is. Cork is a plant, and these would be the cell walls. And then van Leeuwenhoek took some pond water, and he put pond water on a slide, just a drop of pond water. And then when he looked at it inside, he saw all of these little microscopic little bacteria and stuff like that. And he saw living cells for the first time. Now, people started looking at everything. They did all this kind of stuff. And in the 1800s is when we made our broad sweeping statements. A scientist by the name of Matthias Sliden said that all plants are made of cells. Every single plant that you see there is going to be made up of cells. Not to be outdone. Theodore Schwann here said that all animals were made up of cells, and therefore all living things are going to be made up of cells. And then another scientist by the name of Rudolf Virchow said that cells came from other cells. So these three statements here became very important, and they were very defining of our entire idea and the concept of a cell. Okay, so let's take a look at Schleiden, Schwann's, and Virchow's statements. They came together, and you can see down here that in 1655 is when Robert Hooke saw the first cell. Okay, Hooke here in 1674, and then in 1683 saw the first living cells. And then in 1838 is when we had the cell theory proposed by Schleiden and Schwann. Now, the cell theory is the tenant for cell biology, and it has three different parts to it. So let's look at those first. The first part here says that all living things are made of cells. So, Schleiden said that it was plants, Schwann said that it was animals, the cell theory says that all living things are going to be made of cells, and that all of these cells are going to have some components that are the same, and the biggest one is going to be this DNA, the plans on how that cell is supposed to work. All right, the next part here is that cells are the basic units of structure and living in all things. So for something to be alive, it has to be made up of cells. It can be a single-celled organism, or it can be a multi-celled organism like ourselves, and if it's multi-celled, that means it's made up of many cells. 
And then finally, we get Virchow's idea here that cells only come from present cells. So cells come from cells. That's how they work. They can't spontaneously make new cells. It's they come from other ones. All right? And that's our cell theory, and that's basically the foundation of biology. And we'll be talking about all of these different tenets as the class goes on. Okay, that's it. Good luck in the lessons. And as always, we'll see you in the next video. Okay. First thing we're going to talk about is homeostasis. And homeostasis, by definition, is the ability of an organism to maintain their internal conditions. And it's a little more than that. It's the ability of an organism to maintain its body at the optimal conditions for life. So if we just take a look at ourselves, we're warm-blooded. We like our body to be about 98.6 degrees. And the reason for that is that's where our enzymes allow all these reactions to happen that allows us to live. So if we get too hot on a hot day, let's say, or if we're out exercising, then our body has ways of adapting to that. It's sweating is the primary one, and that'll cool the body off. If it's cold, our body has to warm the body up to that temperature, and it does so by things like shivering. So by being able to keep your body at that optimal temperature, which is just one of many conditions, that allows life to happen. Okay. So homeostasis can affect the way that we look at substances, and that can be the way that they move across the cell membrane into and out of the cell or where they are in the cell. And there's a passive way that this happens, and it's called diffusion. And diffusion quite simply says that if I have a whole bunch of something in a high concentration, that naturally it's going to want to spread out and fill up the entire space. And that could be the same in an example if we took like a girl and put her in a corner and she sprayed some perfume, that eventually the scent of the perfume would spray out throughout the entire room. So that's one way of diffusion. Now what we're gonna look for is we're gonna look at cells and we'll have the inside of the cell, the outside of the cell, and then our cell membrane right here. And you'll notice that the concentration is going to be greater outside the cell in this case. And through this permeable membrane, some of these particles can find their way over here. Now this membrane can control what comes in and out, so it has the ability to say, you know what, we really don't want these in here, and we'll keep them on the outside. And we'll see that important when we talk about the cell membrane. But diffusion means it goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration or to equilibrium, meaning it's all spread out. Okay, the last topic is osmosis, and osmosis is quite simply diffusion of water, and water is a very important thing. Remember, we need water to be alive. When we're talking about osmosis, it's going to be the same way. It's going to go from high concentration to low concentration if it can move. So there are three basic conditions that I want you to be familiar with, okay? The first is isotonic, okay? Tonic refers to the outside environment. Iso is going to be the same. So that means that the concentration in the cell is going to be equal to the concentration out of the cell and then water is free to move in and out. Now we can have two different ways on this. We can have a hypotonic solution. Hypotonic means that the concentration in the cell is greater than the concentration of stuff out of the cell. So the water is going to want to rush into the cell in an effort to balance out those two concentration gradients. And if too much water goes in, then in theory that cell could expand, 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 and eventually it will explode. Now the opposite of that is a hypertonic, and that's where the outside of the cell has more than the inside. Say if we took a fresh water cell and put it in salt water, there's more salt on the outside, so the water from inside the cell is going to rush out and try and dilute out the salt water. So the water will rush out of these cells, and eventually if it's let go, it'll shrivel up and the cell will die. Okay. So that's our brief talk on homeostasis, diffusion, and osmosis. Um, the lessons will go into it in a little more detail. Good luck on them, and as always, we'll see you in the next video. So let's begin today with a discussion on prokaryotic cells. Our prokaryotic cells are identified by the fact that they only have an external membrane. So they only have one membrane that separates them from the outside world. The most common example of our prokaryotic cells are going to be the bacteria. Now the bacteria are going to be named from their shape. We have the cosi, which are going to be circular. 
we have the bacilla, which are going to be kind of rod-shaped, and a really good example is the one down here. And then we have spirilla, which are going to be kind of spiral-shaped. And this is how we classify the bacteria. Now, as I mentioned, they have one cell membrane that separates them from the world. Um, they can have some other things with them. Their DNA is just kind of lying around inside of it. Um, they do have ribosomes, so they are able to manufacture proteins. They'll have these little pili coming off the side, little like hair looking like things. And then sometimes they'll have a single and solitary flagellum, and that's for locomotion. Now, one of the interesting things about prokaryotic cells is the way they reproduce. They do that through binary fission. And through that, what happens is, is the DNA inside the cell will duplicate. So now they have two sets of DNA. One side goes to one side of the cell. The other side will go to the other side of the cell. It'll split right here down through the middle, and it creates two daughter cells that are exactly the same. So it's kind of just copying that cell and making two copies out of it. Okay, so now let's talk about eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells differentiate themselves from the prokaryotic cells in the sense that they have multiple membranes. So they all still have this external membrane here, which separates them from the outside world. But inside, we start to notice that there are structures. And these structures here are membrane-bound areas of the cell, which allow them to have a specialized area of function. Perhaps the easiest way to determine you have a eukaryotic cell is if you look at it under a microscope, you'll see this big structure here in the middle. That's going to be the nucleus, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later on in the unit. Okay, so let's review really quickly. We have our prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, and we looked at that makes them the same. Our eukaryotic cell is going to have a nucleus, and it does have these membranes which surround these internal structures called organelles. Humans are eukaryotic organisms, and here's the organelles right down here. Now, in contrast, we learned about the prokaryotic cells. The prokaryotic cells are the bacteria. Notice they don't have a nucleus, they don't have internal membranes, they don't have organelles, but they do reproduce by binary fission, which means they just simply make a copy of themselves. So that's the difference between the two. Prokaryotic only has one membrane. The eukaryotic cells can have many membranes. Okay, and if you can recall back, when we were talking about how things are put together, we talked about atoms forming molecules, forming macromolecules, forming organelles, forming into these cells. And we have an example of one here. This is what a muscle cell would look like. We have four basic levels of organization. When we're talking about organisms, we take it down to the cells. All of them are gonna be made of those cells. If I get a bunch of cells working together, I come up with a tissue, okay? And then if I put a bunch of tissues working together, we get an organ, like here in the stomach. And then finally, those organ systems are going to come together, like the digestive system, and ultimately we end up with our organism here as a whole. Okay, so that's how we organize things. You'll see how we're going to talk about those a little bit later on in the course. Um, as you know, the lessons will go over what we covered here today in a lot more detail. Good luck with the lessons, and we'll see you in the next video. Okay, if you can recall back on our discussion on lipids, we were talking about the phospholipids and how they formed a lipid bilayer for a cell membrane. Remember, the cell membrane is what separates the inside from the outside of the cell, and it's made up of this lipid bilayer. Okay, the lipid bilayer, each of these phospholipids has a hydrophilic head, which means that it likes water on this part here, and then it has these two fatty acid tails, which are hydrophobic, which means that they repel water. Water doesn't like to cross that. So because of that, all of these little tails here make a boundary that will keep water either inside or outside of the cell. So water can't transport through that one. However, there's other molecules there. These other molecules, you can see them here, are the protein channels. And those there will allow molecules to go through. So whether it's a carbohydrate chain that we can see coming through this way, or if it's water even traveling through in and out of the cell that way, that's what allows it to do. So the structure of the cell membrane, because of this double layer, it allows it to attach to the water so it's not forced through or things of that nature. That's what this hydrophilic side does. And then this hydrophobic provides this barrier so water can't flow in and out freely. Now, we can see here we have our cell membrane again. We have the outside of the cell here, the inside of the cell here. Our phosphates all line up here. Our lipids here form this barrier that doesn't allow things to travel through in water. 
And then what we notice is we have these transport proteins. And you can see that we have a higher concentration of the solutes outside and a low one inside. So what's going to happen through the process of diffusion is this particle here is going to kind of get back into the cell and it'll do so through this transport protein. So these are kind of like windows or doors to the cell membrane and that's what allows them to work so that things can get in and out. Okay, just a few final words here for you in this one. Um, we want to talk about the extracellular matrix and that's in animal cells. So if we draw a couple animal cells, this extracellular matrix, this is the outside goo on the outside of a cell that allows them to kind of stick together. And because of that, that's how we can build up these bigger organisms and things like that. That's what allows the cells to stick together. Now inside the cell, okay, we'll add our nucleus here and then we have our mitochondria and we'll talk about them a little bit later. We have our endoplasmic reticulum and all that kinds of good stuff that we'll be talking about, but we have all the organelles. The organelles and the goo is what we call the cytoplasm. So when we're talking about cytoplasm, we're talking about everything inside of the cell membrane. The actual goo that everything is in is called the cytosol. Okay, so make sure that we kind of understand those two differences in words. And that's all we have here for the cell membrane video. Um, remember, the lessons will go through it in a lot more detail. Good luck on the lessons, and as always, we'll see you in the next video. Okay, the first method of transport we're going to talk about is this passive transport system here, and we're going to talk about diffusion. If you remember diffusion, it was talking about how things naturally move from a high concentrate to a low concentrate. So here, if we look in our cell drawings down here, we see outside of the cell and inside, and notice that the area outside has a higher concentrate than the area inside the cell. So through the process of diffusion, as long as those particles can move through the cell membrane, they will do so and they will move in this direction. So we see them moving into the cell and once we reach equilibrium, meaning that the concentration is the same inside and outside, then we'll see that the particles can move freely in and out of the cell. But what happens if those molecules can't move through the cell membrane? Remember, they form this little barrier here, so not everything's gonna be able to go through this cell membrane. So then we talk about facilitated diffusion. And facilitated diffusion is where we use these protein channels and that's gonna allow things to move into or out of the cell. So it's still passive in the sense that it's happening by diffusion, but the benefit here is it allows larger molecules to move through because of the protein channels. Sometimes diffusion isn't enough, and then we talk about active transport. Now, active transport means that we are using energy. Okay, this is what active means, and that we're using energy to move these particles across the transport protein. Okay, so we'll take these molecules out here, even though the concentration is greater, it takes a little bit of energy to drive them this way. With active transport, we can also make it where we have a low concentration and a high concentration, and we're still able to move across this concentration gradient. Okay, finally, what happens if we have a molecule or we have something that's too big for the protein channels to come through? Then we have this neat process called endocytosis. Endo means inside. So what we're gonna talk about is moving something from the outside of the cell, this needed substrate, and putting it inside the cytoplasm, moving it across the cell membrane. Now the way that that works is if we have our little particles out here, the cell membrane will actually start to pinch off a little bit like this and it'll capture these in here and eventually it'll pinch off a little bit more like so and ultimately what happens is, is you notice that a little piece of the membrane here is pinched off and we have what we were looking for this substance here is now inside the cell. This membrane will dissolve or break open and that'll get those particles, that substrate, into the cell for use. Now, endocytosis brings stuff in, exocytosis will get stuff out. So if we have unwanted substances inside the cell, then what it'll allow it to do is it allows it to get them outside of the cell relatively quickly. So the same process happens. We have a little membrane bound vacuole here with our unwanted substances inside and that's going to merge here with the cell membrane. As it does so it's going to split open so it'll come together and it'll merge like this and then it'll split open as such and we can see the net result down here 
that all of the products, all of these substances we didn't want have all been released outside of the cell. And this is exo. So endo means come in, exo means to exit or go out. Okay, let's review these types of transport real quickly. Um, there are two types. We had passive and active. Remember, passive, it just happens, so it does not require energy. The active one here does require energy. We mentioned passive ones as diffusion and facilitated diffusion, and if that diffusion is water, it's going to be the process of osmosis. Now, when it's active, most of the time it'll use these transport proteins, but sometimes the molecules are so big that we end up having to use this endocytosis to bring it in or this exocytosis to get it out of the cell. Okay. Well, that's it for transport across the membranes, as always. Our lessons will go into it in a lot more detail, but this should get you started. Um, good luck on your lessons, and as always, we'll see you at the next video.